thanksgiving for our salvation and for making this gathering possible by the power of your Holy Spirit alone. We ask you now, dear Jesus, to assume your position as the founder and as the pastor and as the teacher of this church as we move forward in that worship in our prayers and in our songs and as we go in your word. Thank you. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Before we worship this morning with, in song, I want to open up with just a word from 1 John, a scripture that is one of those go-to scriptures, if you will. 1 John chapter 3. See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. And that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what will be, will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. We're going to talk this morning a lot about being in the kingdom of God and what that means and what we should concern ourselves with and what we shouldn't concern ourselves with. But the foundational truth of that is that when you give yourself over in belief of Jesus as the Christ of God, you become a child of God. And you will then become actually entitled to the kingdom of God. That is amazing and fantastic. So, as we worship this morning, keep that in the back of your minds. And would you please stand as you're able and join us. Chorus number 29. <clears throat>
celebrate that. We worship you, God, for what you have done. The fact that you've done that for us to draw us into you, close to you, so that we can sing and we can pray and we can turn our hearts over to you, Father. That we can see the bigger picture of creation and what you have planned. We love you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you for the interview. Nice. Everybody good? You still mad at me? No. Okay. <laughs> There's there really good traits from being a public school teacher and not some really great traits of being a public school teacher. One of the great traits, one of the not so great traits of being a public school teacher is that I do know how to shame people into doing it. <laughs> it's a skill. It's a practice skill. But I, I don't know. I was on a roll this morning. Yeah, scared people. Scared people. And I have to admit, I, I did. I, I shared with Megan that I did that on purpose. She was there with her coffee, and I don't know what got. It was the devil. It got into me. She was there with her coffee, and I, when I walked in, and I thought, ha, ha, ha. And I said, good morning. And I thought that she would startle when she spilled, spilled her coffee over her hand. Now she's threatening lawsuits. I have to apologize. I was... Apologizing to young Miss Jolene over there. I said good morning to her and I patted her on the top of the head like she was like a little dog or something. I said, I'm sorry, you deserve more respect than that. I don't know what's wrong with you people. The thing is, it's the same thing that's wrong with all of you. That's right. We're human beings. That's right. And we uh, we live in this world as redeemed souls, and that's that's awesome. Um and that's sort of where I want to go today. I, I got lost in Luke this week when I entered into uh, my gospel readings. And I, I really got lost in Luke chapter 12. So right off the bat, I'm going to tell you that there is a lot here in Luke chapter 12. It's a long chapter, and it's about a variety of different things, so to speak. So your homework is to investigate all of Luke chapter 12, and then what we talk about here this morning, watch how it is a part of the bigger teaching of all of Luke chapter 12. Does that make sense? Because it's, it's difficult sometimes. I'm, you know that I'm not one of those preachers who takes a verse from the Bible and then just applies it to all kinds of different things. I'd sort of reverse that equation, and I want to go inside the Word and find out what the Word is actually saying in the time it was being written. So I don't pull something out and say, you know, go on forever about how this might apply to your finances or to your marriage or to whatever the case may be. So I want you to really investigate Luke chapter 12 because he's talking about something here in Luke that is near and dear to all of our hearts. And that is how we worry over this life. And all throughout the chapter, he talks about people and he talks about money. He talks about position. He talks about religion and how we worry over that. He talks about all the different facets of our human existence and how we fret over them. Does anybody even say fret anymore? We fret over them, right? We worry over them. And so I've chosen this particular teaching, which you've probably heard before, but it really <laughs> is one of my favorites, Frank. <laughs> so, <laughs> Put that on the list. <laughs> Put that on the list of my favorites. Um, and so and it really, really does serve to demonstrate what we really are supposed to turn our hearts toward, or who, and, and spoiler alert, who we're supposed to turn our hearts to and what we really should be concerned with. So he's in the middle of this larger teaching, which that is your homework, to investigate that larger teaching. And that's when we hear this word, then, then someone called from the crowd, teacher, 
Please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. So here's the problem, and many of us have been down this road. If there is a passing, then the family does what? Argues about the possessions that are left behind. And even if you're a believer or a non-believer, you know, probably know that that's not the nicest thing to do or the right way to go about it, but we in our human being self do this. He says, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. And Jesus replied, friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Now, Jesus does this many, many times in his teachings. He, and, and it's actually a, a teaching technique that we'll be talking about in a couple of weeks. But you lay down the foundational principle, and then you spend a good deal of time demonstrating what it means. And so it would be like I'm coming in here and all I have is the title of a sermon. And so I just simply walk in here and I give you the title of the sermon, which may be a big main idea of the sermon, and then I walk out. That's not very good teaching. So Jesus says, I'm, I'm going to talk here about life is not measured by how much you own. There's the big picture. There's the big idea. And now he's going to use lots of examples from your life. There isn't anything here that doesn't relate to us in the 21st century. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced prime, prime, what? Is that right? No. Okay, <laughs> sorry. That produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all of my crops. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And then I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. You will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. And so we see in that last statement, uh, the, we see the foundational principle that we just talked about with a little addition to it. So your life is not measured by what you own. And now Jesus has added, here is one of the ways in which it is measured rich relationship with God. So you can ask, if he comes in and confronts it and says, I just want to share with you that your life is not measured by how much you own, one of the questions you may ask is, well, how is it measured? And here's his first response. It's measured by a rich relationship with God. So now he's going to take us deeper, deeper into this teaching, so that we can really talk about preachers, a, a good preacher will apply this to your life. Well, yeah, but read your Bible. Jesus does the same thing constantly, over and over and over. It's there for you, and you don't need me. You see what I'm saying? We can, like, wow, look at these teachings of Jesus. It's as though he's teaching right in the 21st century. It's because it's written by God. It kind of works that way. It's, it's timeless. Then, turning to his disciples, Jesus said, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. And now he's going to get very specific. Whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear. For life is more than food, and your body is more than clothing. Look at the ravens. That's not a majestic bird by any, chance, any stretch of the imagination. Look at the ravens, he says. They don't plant or harvest or store food in the barn in barns, for God feeds them. And then he gets a little chuckle again. We've read this before. He says, and you are far more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? 
And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? Now, again, I stopped here this week in my devotional reading because it's one of those phrases that I have read so many times. And then all of a sudden I'm reading it and it goes, adding time to your life is a little thing. No, it's not. <laughs> From God's perspective, he says, but if worrying, and if worrying can't accomplish a little thing like that, that's not a little thing. Adding time to your very life. Now, from God's perspective, sure it is. That's maybe a thought, maybe a word, maybe what I don't know all how God operates. But for him, that's a little thing. For us, we read over that and go, well, wait a minute, God. That's a kind of a big thing, adding time to my life. But I think here is why he's teaching it this way. <clears throat> Remember when he says, when we talked about it last week, if you cling to this life, you will lose it. But if you set your mind on God, you will gain, right? You will have life. We all, for the most part, would like to add time to our lives. And I believe that Jesus is trying to make us stop and think and say, I know that this is what you want. In your human selves and in your bodies, and you don't want to be ill, and you don't want to die, and you think about your life, and you're clinging to your life, and you're clinging to all of the stuff that you have here on earth, including the people. And for you, that's a big deal. But for me, it's not. Because there is a much, 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 much bigger picture. And so when I stopped and I thought about that, why would Jesus teach that this way? Because that's not a little thing. It's not at all. But it shows both sides of the coin. It shows me worrying if I do this. And really the essence of my worry and the decisions that I'm making is I, I want to continue to live. I want to add time to my life. You can't. You can't. And so that really puts a lot of our treadmill. I got to do this. I got to do that. I, I want to be this. I want to be that. You know, in, in perspective. Because we learn from the Psalms and we learn from Jesus himself. Every hair on your head is measured. And every day of on, on earth is measured. And you like you, okay, there's, there's, there's three pointing back at me, so I know that, and you, we, can't do anything about that. So just stop it. <laughs> okay, so that's where the, one of the first places I got stuck. Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? We would love it if they could, because we're selfish and we're egotistical, and, and, and that's not like, I don't mean that in horrible, horrible ways. We just want to live. Right? And if worry can accomplish a little thing like that, what's the sense of worrying about bigger things? Well, what, what's bigger? Okay. So look at the lilies and how they grow. We move from the ravens to the lilies. Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. That's amazing. And again, that's a big perspective shot. There's a, a we can look at creation. When I, when I looked out this morning, we, did anyone look last evening with just a few clouds here and there in that gigantic moon? Yes. I mean, it was just, yes. it was just, whoa. And then when I woke up this morning and I went out and the sun was still behind those trees and it was shooting out that sort of red and yellow stuff, beams coming up and they were coming up from behind the trees. It was, I mean, and I could, I could sit there my entire life in all of my humanness. Every, the greatest artist, human artists who ever lived can do their best and never create a picture like that. Amen. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just, and the, so you get this big picture shot, like, oh my goodness, 
Yeah, I think I'm all that and a bag of chips. No, you're not. Look at this. That's just a typical sunrise. That's just like every day. Right? So I, anyway. So look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Beautiful. And then he chastises us. Why do you have such little faith? When you wake up in the morning and you look over to the east and you see that sunrise and you realize the big picture of it all, and then you're going to turn away from that and, and go and do a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter today. You're going to take your eyes off of Christ. You're going to take your eyes off of God and go do. Like, why would you do that? Why do you not think that you are important to me? You, my creation. Look what I've done for the lilies. Look what I do at every sunrise. Look what I do every single day, every minute. Why do you think you're not important and that I won't care for you? It's important that he just doesn't give us the really wonderful poetry flowery stuff. He says at the end of it, so why do you have such little faith? You don't think I love you? You're going to find out in a short while how much I love you. As my incarnate body is tortured and beaten beyond human recognition, and I am nailed with spikes to an old piece of wood and left there to bleed and die so that I, your sins can be forgiven. You don't think I love you? You got to go do it your way? And I can just, like, I can, I can see him. Because every good parent would do this. I've done all I can, right? I mean, like, that's on you <laughs> from that point on. That's on you. Okay. Why do you have such little faith? And don't be concerned about what to eat and what to drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. Again, I've read that a lot, but I stop there again because Jesus is making this comparison. If you are an unbeliever still living behind the veil, still unaware that salvation is available, still unaware of a supernatural worldview of salvation and eternal life, even if your eyes are blinded to the fact that there is eternal life, it will be in heaven or it will be in hell. All of those things, then these are the things that you worry about. If your eyes are blinded to any sort of a, well, any sort of a, let me rephrase that. If your eyes are blinded to the bigger picture of creator God, father God, redeemer Jesus Christ, sustain our Holy Spirit, right? God with us. If your eyes are closed to that, then how much you make, how much you earn really, really does matter to you. Because you don't really have anything important to compare it to. Where you live really does matter to you. You may even be obsessed by these thoughts because you will find yourself comparing how much you make and where you live to other people and how much they make and where they live, and what they drive, and how they do this, and what schools their kids are in, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. And God recognizes the fact that those will become important. They will be the most important things in your life. And he is opening our eyes to the fact that that is utterly pathetic when we talk about who we are in Christ. And we've experienced that. 
And I know that I'm speaking into people because I know that I've experienced it and I've walked with people who have experienced it as well. You can own all of the things of this world that you want. And when your heart beats for the last time, zero of it matters. Nothing. It becomes somebody else's problem. It's the truth. Like, I've got all of this. I've got the house on the hill. I, I, I am the master of all I survey. I own nearly everything that a person could possibly own. And when you're dead, it is nothing but a bunch of trash and junk for other people to worry about. God's trying desperately to point that out to us, that unbelievers will be obsessed with all of those things. But for the believer, there is a bigger picture. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. I mean, God knows his creation. He knows how history is going to unfold. And he's being really real right here. And to, we need to understand that. So what's going to separate you from the unbeliever? But your father already knows your needs. And here is what you need. This is another thing that I put together. Because it's not random that this next sentence comes next. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. And he will give you everything you need. Amen. You see how that works? So for the unbeliever, they are just absolutely driven by these pathetic, superficial needs to measure themselves against other people. And, and we know, and we, and we know in practical fact, and scripture also teaches us that none of that matters. It may be fun, we may have it, we may not have it. Remember the scripture from Paul? I've learned the secret of being content in all things, and that is I have my faith in Christ. And we're being taught that again. Your contentment is not in those things. What you leave behind is not your house. What you leave behind is your son. It's your people. It's every individual who you have shared the truth about Jesus Christ with. It is every good thing that you've ever done that leaves an impression, most of which we will never know about. Somebody, somewhere, some down, down the line, sometime, will remember what you've done for them and return a kindness sometime, somewhere, that you'll never know about, but you were the model for it. That's really cool. And those are the things that matter. Should you die surrounded by your house, in your car, all of those things, like maybe you just go withdraw all of your money out of the bank and dump it on your deathbed and just be so happy with that. Or should you die if you could? Could you, wouldn't it be a, the true, a true gift from God to see every individual who you have positively influenced around the world? Like the web of people. Because I shared something nice with Stacy, and a, she shared something as that model. And that person learned from that and shared that with two other people who shared that. Wouldn't that be that? Oh, man. Well, here's the kicker. When you go to heaven, you'll be able to. So when we talk about the things that matter, you see how Jesus takes us from that one foundational teaching brings it full circle and says, here's how this all works. Seek the kingdom of God first. And when you actually do have faith in me, and we talk about this all the time in here, when you actually do have faith in me, when you have actually given your life over to me, I'll take care of the rest. And the ultimate gift that I will give you is victory over sin and death. And so its power will not have power over you while you're alive here on earth. Oh, and by the way, you'll be able to spend eternity with me. 
I'll trade that for a house any day. I'll trade, I'll, now you know I'm serious. I'll trade that for my Harley Davidson any day of the week. Right? That's all if you were there. But I would. I mean, that, 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 that thing is fun. I love it. Nah, you know. Okay. So we learned that we come full circle with this teaching. What does it take to be happy? What does it take to have everything you need? And Jesus teaches us a few different things about not to worry about the material things. And then he says, when you look around you, you will see the world divided into unbelievers and believers. And if you are professing to be a believer, but you are living like an unbeliever, that's not cool. Because unbelievers are really worried about all of these superficial things that don't actually matter. So if you are professing to be a believer and still clinging to your gold, You need to evaluate yourself in the mirror and what your faith actually means to you. And he says, why do you have such little faith that you simply won't trust me with you? Gold and all. And whether it lasts another five days on earth or whether it lasts another 50 years on earth, trust me first then you can actually be happy. So again, take that piece of teaching and then go back to the beginning of 12 and ex examine for yourself how it fits into the teaching that comes before it, because it does, and the teaching that comes after it, because it does. And this is the center piece here of the real foundational teaching. And that is, seek the kingdom of God above all else. And trust Him. Hardest thing for any human being to do. Trust Him. And I will take care of it. That's what I'm always talking about the church. The church, you know, is, is seeking people, chasing people, going after people. No, we're supposed to chase after Christ. We trust Jesus with this church. He by the power of his Holy Spirit, will take care of the people. We've got to be careful not to put it and go worshiping people. We're supposed to be worshiping and trusting Christ. So that equation works in all facets of our lives. Amen? <clears throat> so again, I encourage you as we move forward here today, well, as we move through our break, I'm going to pray here. We'll have a time of sharing our stories of anointing and prayer. If you choose to stay with us, that's fantastic. That's a wonderful, wonderful part of our time together on Sunday mornings. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for opening your word to us this morning. Thank you for teaching us, for caring enough about us, for loving us enough to demonstrate again and again and again, to teach again and again and again in a variety of different ways about your love for us, about eternal life, about how we can be the most complete human being that we can be. And of course that is only possible when we give ourselves over to be a son or a daughter of the Most High God. Help us in our faith, Father God. Help us to trust you. To love one another as you love us. To forgive one another as you have forgiven us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Bless you guys. We'll be back, like I said, very shortly. I suppose when you hear the bells ring.